everybody. I'm Tom Vassell, and welcome to Board Game Breakfast. This is a show about board games and the people who play them, and we talk about all sorts of weird and unusual things. Not really weird, not even unusual, but just about board games in general. We are coming off of... Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had Digital Spiel, and at this point, most of the big games of the year have been released, or they're about to be released, so there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, there's a lot of news and things that are happening, too, and in fact, if you all are looking for news, we do Board Game Breakfast twice a week. This is once the pre-recorded show that we put out, and you know, this is where I do Tom Thinks and stuff like that, but also, we do a show on Thursdays, we do it live Thursday mornings with me, Z, and Stephen Bonacore, and we talk Talk about the board game news and how it might affect you and us and just, you know, our thoughts on it. This particular show is sponsored by Pandasaurus Games. We've been talking about God Love Dinosaurs and also this little card game, which I'm a big fan of, Ohanami here, which is just, it's like a, if you played their other game called, well, the game, uh, this is a very similar thing, but it's a game where you're drafting cards putting them, stacking them, and then scoring points. It sounds really simple, but it's a game I've played over and over again. And we're giving out three copies of that. And so to enter that contest, you just need to email us at contest at dicetower.com and then just put in the subject line the word stacks because you're making stacks of cards, S-T-A-C-K-S. -S. Um, and then in the body, put your address and you have a week to enter. Um, just so everyone knows, if you win a contest on our show, we, we run contests all the time. Watch our live stuff, watch our things to see what's in, you know, what you can win. If you win one, we we'll let you know. So if you don't get notified, but we are in the process of building a web page that has all the Dice Tower winners on it for our different contests. That's not done yet, but it's almost done. That way you'll be able to go check that to see who's won various games and hopefully that will be helpful to everybody. Alrighty, with that being said, let's get started. Right, so here's what I found on the internet this week. Uh, this is a, a YouTube channel, which you probably heard of before ours, because it's a much bigger channel than ours. But I like to make stuff. And in this particular video I found, which I guess he made earlier this year in May, uh, he makes his own box for storing X-Wing miniatures, which is pretty cool. Uh, woodworking is something that I admire from a distance. I look at it and go, Ooh, and it's not something I'm good at, although I, you know, like with anything, if I wanted to be good at it, I probably could. And this channel certainly helps. He shows exactly how he uses all his tools and makes these really beautiful boxes. It's a pretty in-depth video, so we'll put a link in the description so you can see more about it. So if you want to, you know, if you have woodworking equipment and you want to make your own X-Wing box, this shows you how to do it. That's what I found on the internet this week. Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Apple University. Today we're going to talk about Roll for the Galaxy, the app. So, a little bit different there. Yep, this will be one of the uh, latest games to make the transition from tabletop to an app. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we've played through that, it played pretty well. I was actually hesitant at first because, what the app? Because there's a reason why I like board games with a tactile bit. I well, I do used to play a lot of computer games, I still do, but it was like I'm always have got that has just hesitant feeling of switching over. But this one's good, it's capturing it really well. Um, like pleasantly surprised. Yeah. I think like many tableau building games, tableau builders don't necessarily translate really well to app form. And I, you know, we've played the Terraforming Mars app as well. Mm -hmm. When you've got to pull up each card, or in this case, each uh, world tile individually and read through it, That's that right. can be a problem. Yep. But this one does have the icons. You can see the icons at a glance as well. And as long as you can read icon, uh, you're pretty well good. Yeah, it's it's easy. Yeah, it's, that's the other one that we play at Terraforming Mars, which we're going to talk about. Um, but it's, it simplifies a lot of things, it makes the games really quick and we play two games in a row in a, yep. in a night. So yeah, I would totally recommend it if you like Roll for the Galaxy. And we are Meeple University on YouTube and on the Dice Tower. See you next time! 
Hi everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Today we're talking about Pendulum. This is a game that's a worker placement game. Uh, you have the option of making it a real-time game or not. Uh, but yeah, wherever you place your guy, you're going to have these different actions they can do. They're going to be trapped there for a little while as the timers kind of do their thing. Uh, but then also... Wherever you take your actions, you're going to get to do this whole series of actions that you've set aside, uh, programmed ahead of time with these other cards. So there's kind of a lot going on. The timers can make it really chaotic, but this is a super interesting game. So we are a house divided. I prefer this timed because towards the end, it's really chaotic. I will admit it's boring in the beginning, but towards the end, it's chaotic, and I just love that chaos. But for some reason, my methodically planned out husband does not like that. I just don't know why. I like the ability to see when my characters are gonna, or when my meeples are gonna be going to a certain spot, when they're gonna collect certain resources, and when they're gonna get off that spot, so that way I can know where to put them somewhere else so that I can get some other resources at the exact same time I need them to. It's moving at the same time every time. Yeah, but it's like, uh, Everyone's jumping around to me. We gotta block that out of a spot, and then now you can't do that thing, and now it's, your whole game's ruined. I know, isn't it great? This production of this game is fantastic, whether you play it timed or not timed. Uh, all the bits are just really nice plastic. All the cards and the player boards are this really thick vinyl coated uh, material, and uh, man, it looks fantastic too. It was interesting to see how the scoring happened to this game. Basically, you all start in the negative, and you have these different tracks that you're working up, so you don't even get to score until you pass this point and then you can start scoring so this just means you failed you failed you failed you don't win okay now you can start scoring and you start way over here and i thought that was really interesting so the great game be sure to play it not timed <laughs> you can play it timed if you want to hear more from us you can find us on facebook or youtube we are ryan and bethany board game reviews everybody this is ryan i'm bethany hoping you have a happy healthy breakfast bye, bye guys Hey folks, today we're talking about how to host a game night. You'll notice this is an advanced reader's edition. Um, so this is, there's, there might be some changes in the final book, but this is from Eric Arneson. And Eric for a while uh, hosted about Dot com. He hosted the game sections. That's how I got to know him. This is way back in the day. But he talks about how to host a game night in here. And this is actually he kind of ties in with Tom thinks today a little bit. But in here, there's some very specific chapters where he talks about the ground rules, how to have a good game night, and then different types of game nights. Two-player game nights, small group game nights, large group game nights, having an extra large game night, you know, like 11 to 20 players, game days, game weekends, then small game conventions, and then things like theme game nights, and then something that might be very apropos for now, the virtual game nights, and then some thanks for the gaming memories. Now, I will admit, a lot of this I really like because many of the people that he talks about, he talks about a lot of different folks here, I know who many of them are. A lot of them are different people involved in the gaming industry in different ways. So that's kind of fun for me to read. But I think there's a lot of good stuff in here. And then when you do have um, something like here, small group game nights, he gives examples of games and then talks about that game in particular. So here, small group game nights. So Ticket to Ride, Wingspan, The Crew, Parks, um, Wits and Wagers, Azul, Just One, The Mind, Oceans, Terraforming Mars. This is solid good stuff, and he talks about what to do. Who's allowed to come to your game thing? You know, what to do if there's problems. Um, I really like this book a lot. This is, you know, uh, a useful thing in our industry. He talks a lot about different people. You know, and he talks about when learning how to play a game. He used Rodney Smith from Watch It Played. Well, right, you know, that makes sense. And so this is something that if you are thinking about running a game night or game group at your house, this is not a bad thing to read. If for nothing else, it's... Very well written and interesting to read, but also has a list of games that you can play. It's not very long, 163 pages. I really enjoyed this a lot. Definitely recommend how to host a gaming night. Hey, I'm comedian Grant Lyon with Grant's Game Rex, and today I want to recommend the epic pirate adventure game Forgotten Waters. And don't worry, I won't be doing a pirate voice in this video. Yeah, but I will. Nope. No, I told you you were not allowed in this video. And why not? Because everybody does a pirate voice when they recommend a pirate game and I don't want to do it. Well, I'm not everybody. For when I was just a boy, I sailed the seven seas. La 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 la. I came upon a kraken and nobody said the beast could be slain. Blast, he's a persistent nerd. 
If you're looking for tons of strategy, this is not your game. But if you're looking for an epic adventure that takes you all over and gives you tons of memorable moments, then this is perfect. Forgotten Waters is a collaborative game. You will be sailing your pirate ship around the map, stopping in various locations and doing activities. Each player will control a different role on the ship, like first mate or gunner or boat swim, boat, boat swain, boat person. There are treasure cards associated and story cards and an app that you use for the game that has amazing voice acting. So every time you go to a new location, you get some awesome, hilarious story. Long ago, people spoke of a land called Sunset. They say about life, it's not the journey, it's the destination. And they say about Forgotten Waters, there's, there's not much of a destination, but the journey is pretty tight. I say that, I'm the one that says that about Forgotten Waters. Hello folks and welcome to Dad Boards where we explore the parallels between playing games and parenthood. My name is Anthony, here's today's topic. Purple. That's right, folks, colors. As you can see, we've been working with uh, identifying colors with our son, AJ, recently. And so I thought, what is a very colorful game I can talk about today? And that game is Quirkle. Now, Quirkle does come with an actual box. I don't have any more. Keep the whole thing in this bag. There's five reasons why I like the game Quirkle. First is, it is very pretty to look at. The wooden tiles are outlined in black, and there's different colors and shapes on them. Six colors in the game altogether. So it looks very cool on the table as you're putting them out. Uh, second reason is it's very easy to teach. There's basically one rule in this game, which is that when you put a tile out, it's got to match the color or the shape next to the tile that's already on the table. That's it. Once you know that, you can play the game, which leads into reason number three. This is a family-friendly game, folks. Anybody can play this. Uh, younger folks can, can be competitive with the older folks, and there's not a lot of hurt feelings in this game, really, overall. Um, fourth reason is this game is quite durable. Uh, having a toddler, a lot of my games are not safe uh, from him because I'll eat them or rip them or do something to them. But again, these are chunky wooden tiles. He can't break them. He can't eat them. The worst thing that could happen is he might lose one, which is why I gave him his very own copy of the game to do whatever he wants with. Last reason is this game is very available and affordable. You can get this online um, at any retail store, game store, anywhere really. And it's almost always about 25 bucks or less, uh, so it's pretty cheap. If you are looking for something that's similar but a little more complicated, I highly recommend the game Azul. Um, also laying down some tiles, also very pretty to look at. Again, just a little more complicated than Quirkle. Check that out. All right, guys, that's it for today. Thanks for watching, and keep working on those colors. All right, what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, I'm excited. A lot of uh, bigger board game reviews. I'll be taking a look at Winter Kingdom, um, which is the uh, sequel of sorts, the Kingdom Builder, the Ticket to Ride Amsterdam, the Lost Ruins of Arnak, one of the hot games uh, from... Uh, Essen. And as a group, we're going to be taking a look at Dune Imperium. So all that's coming out this week. There's probably, I haven't yet said it by the time of me recording this, probably a top 10 coming your way. We got a couple live plays. And of course, check out our weekly videos. Every Wednesday, we talk about kickstarting projects on our show, Crowd Surfing. Uh, we have, a, like I mentioned earlier in the show, we have a really fun board game breakfast with a game show and the news on each Thursday morning. And of course, we play board game apps. There's a lot of cool things. Also, don't forget to check out the Dice Tower podcast. Manny and Suzanne will have a show going up tomorrow and many other podcasts on our network. If you're like wanting to just hear about board games as you run or drive or whatever, this, there's so much there. And you can find all that at DiceTowerNetwork.com. Hi, I'm Josh, here to talk about another great thematic game mechanism. Back in June on my Josh Yaks YouTube channel, I talked about my top 10 favorite racing board games, and ranked number 4 on that list was Fast Flowing Forest Fellers by Freedom and Freeze. There are several aspects that put the game so high on the list. It's simple to learn and play, the board is highly modular, it's fast paced, like a racing game should be, it's highly interactive, and it has a cool river currents mechanism, which I'm going to highlight here.
I mentioned that this game is highly interactive. That's because when you play your movement cards to move your matching racer, in the process you can push and shove other racers or obstacles. This can allow you to get double value out of your movement card by pushing your own racer forward, or it can get you into a position where when your opponent moves next, they're forced to move you forwards on the track. But the thing you're racing on, the river, isn't a static environment. It has swirls and eddies and currents that can send the things floating upon it in all sorts of directions. So that's where the river current mechanism comes in to turn everything up to 11. After you've completed your movement, everything that has ended up on currents has to follow the current all the way to its end point. Perhaps it's a current that flows towards the finish line and you You've given your own racer a whole bunch of free movement. Or maybe it's a backwards flowing current that will send one of your opponents in the opposite direction. Either way, you're bound to elicit both groans and laughs as you play it out. This clever mechanism injects a certain amount of chaos into the race, but it's an unusually predictable form of chaos because it's all right there on the board for players to see. This isn't the only game where players race down a river. I can think of Mississippi Queen and Riverboats as two other examples, but it's a game where the simple mechanisms really bring the experience to life. I'll catch you next time with another thematic game mechanism, and until then, I'd also love to see you at my Josh Yaks YouTube channel. Cheers! Hey there Dice Tower fans, my name is Dave and I hope you're having a great breakfast so far. Now today's smash up is going to take two games and do mini smashes. So the first one here is Cat Cafe. Now if you have this game, you know the dice and the pencils are kind of poo poo. So because of that, I went and got Steve Jackson's kitten dice and did a smash up. Let me show you. All right, so this is what you're working with when you get the game with these splintery pencils, which are bleh, and these dice to have the pips kind of showing through the white paint. We don't need these. Okay, so we actually have Amazon pencils that I got with paw prints and the Steve Jackson dice, as you can see the picture right here. So if you have these two things at your house, you can smash them up. Of course, you will have to buy the pencils, but this screams kitten theme, and those things scream kitten please. So the next mini smash is a volcanic one. Now, if you have the game Eruption and you have a kiddo that no longer plays games, but you still have Fire Dragon from Haba, well, you can do a pretty aesthetically pleasing smash. Let me show you. So this is what Eruption looks like during play and aesthetically, it's pretty pleasing. We could take the liberty to spice up these dice a little bit. Now ah, that looks a little better. But the main thing that we want from Fire Dragon is just the volcano, nothing else. Voila, now you have a 3D volcano and boy, it really does spark it up just a tad bit. And you can take the top off and looky looky, you can even put your tiles in there. So that's all the smash ups that I have for you today. Thank you so much for joining me today in this breakfast and come join me at my channel if you'd like at GameVine. Until next time, have a great rest of your day and a great time with all that you play. Bye everybody. For the past few weeks, I've been talking about just interacting with people and last week I talked about who is welcome at my game table. This week I'm talking about who is not welcome at my game table. Now, just because of the internet's love of negativity, I suspect that this video may get more hits than the other one and it really shouldn't. Um, I'm not here to pick, uh, this may go in a different direction than you might think. So. I've been talking about that, and last week when I talked about who's welcome on my game table, I also expanded it and talked about who's welcome on the dice tower. This week I'm being more specific and just talking about who's welcome at a game table that I'm running or who's not welcome specifically. Now, I play games with a lot of people. I will go to the local game group, well, when it opens back up, but when I go to the local game group or convention, if you like playing games, I'm ready to sit down and play with you. I don't really care about anything else. But after that first play, the chance of me playing with you again depends on you know that first play. So I guess the easiest way to say who I won't play games with at my gaming table, who's not welcome at my game table, is jerks. Um, if you are somebody who is a poor winner, a poor loser, um, slow, 
player, not slow to, I mean, I'll play with people who have analysis paralysis, but slow to the point where you just don't care about other people, or you're rude at the table. You bring your political philosophy or whatever and loudly proclaim it at the table or say misogynist or racist things at the table, you're out for me. Um, if you actively are a jerk at the table, you're out. Now, how often does this happen? Well, not as often as you might think. And for many people, I've found that they'll show some of this behavior and whatever, and you mention it to them, and it's something that people can work on and fix. And I think that's an important thing here, is I don't have like a little list like, one strike, you're out, one strike, you're out. There have been people who've done different things. I remember distinctly, this is 15 years ago, I played a game with somebody and they were a real jerk. Uh, they were complaining loudly when dice rolls went against them and everything. There was a confrontation at the table. Later on, I talked it out with this person and they apologized. And when they came back to the gaming table next time, it was much better. It was much improved. I had a friend one time who was a poor loser to the point where nobody wanted to play with that person. And again, this was something I talked to them outside of gaming and I, I mentioned this and this and this and they came back and there was improvement. It wasn't like night and day necessarily, but it was something that I saw and that's the way it should be. Now, if there's no desire to change, well then, yeah, you're probably not welcome at my table. Now, we talked about political opinions and uh, whatever else it might have an opinion of, religious opinions and things like that. I think if there is give and take um, or you're willing to talk about things, maybe that's the case. Now, if someone at the table, for example, let's say we're talking politics. I've talked politics at the gaming table before, and we can talk politics. And I found that talking in person is often much better than, you know, on the Internet. But it's possible that someone at the table is visibly uncomfortable with such a conversation. At that point, I think it should stop. Now, if you don't want it to, again, then you're not welcome at my table because I want it to be a place where people can feel they can come in. There are some comments and some things that are never welcome at tables, and there may be comments and things that specifically apply to me. So, for example, I mentioned this last week. I'm a Christian, and years ago there was someone in the game group who came, and when we played a game, there was something, I think, that mentioned Christianity, and they went off on a large rant about how terrible Christianity was. Okay. They didn't know who I was and everything, but I mentioned it to them, and every game, the same thing kept happening, and that made me a bit uncomfortable. So I stopped playing with them. I didn't kick them out of the gaming group or anything. I just, for me, I didn't want to do as many games with them if that was going to come up in every game. Now, that being said, sometimes you run into the situation where player A will say, I don't like playing with player B for whatever reason. It could be player B's philosophies, but it's usually not. It's because player B is annoying to play games with, they eat at the table, they take too long, whatever it is. Now, in that case, sometimes I can be in a sticky situation, so I will then say, the way I found to deal with that is I'll play a game with player A, and I'll play a game with player B at different times. If I'm inviting them over to my house or studio here to play games, I'll invite them different times and hopefully not invite one more than the other. But I do subscribe to the finger philosophy. This is something I've subscribed to in my life, and I really believe it's true. This is where the man goes to the doctor, and he says, you know, I was touching my head, and my head hurt. I touched my arm, and my arm hurt. I touched my chest, and my chest hurt. And the doctor says, maybe we need to get that finger fixed. Your finger's broken. And so if player A has a problem with player B, and player A has a problem with player C, and player A has a problem with player D, it's player A that is probably going to get invited to my table a little bit less. This happens a lot, and it's exhausting for me. I understand many times that someone will say, oh, I have a problem with this person, and I, okay, I get it. Oh, I have a problem with that person. Okay, I also have a problem with that person. Oh, okay. You know, and then I run into the, well, maybe it's easier for me to just not invite player A to the games. Now, everyone's going to be different here, and I do my best to not have anybody who I have to remove from my gaming table and say, and not invite them back. Not you should kick them out, but just not invite them back. But if that person is actively making it an unfun situation for the other people at the table, then I'd rather have those other people at the table than the person who's making it unfun for everybody else. Everybody's different, of course. I might not be welcome at some people's gaming tables. <laughs> Maybe for things I've said here in the Dice Tower. Um, I try to think about this. You know, if someone comes and says, hey, you were 
too loud or too whatever, you know, you're too vastly at the table. That's something to think about because I don't want to be the person that people don't want at their gaming table. But that's what I thought about today. Tell me what you think in the comments. Iconography is a group of icons within a game. They're small pictures that stand for something else. In Clank, this icon here stands for movement, while this icon down here stands for battle strength. Symbology is the group of symbols within a game. They're small pictures that stand for something else. In Clank, this symbol stands for movement, while this symbol stands for battle strength. That's it. Hello, and welcome back to Retro Board Game Corner. Here I have The Game of Politics, published in 1952 by Parker Brothers. This is a two to six player game in which you're trying to get enough electoral votes to become president. Let me set this up and show you how it works. This is what the game board will look like set up. First, everybody's gonna pick a different color to be, and these little bags contain pins here. And these pins are very sharp. On top of that, each player will receive three speech cards, which will give them a tactical advantage in various states. The game is broken down into six separate areas. Area number one is yellow. Area number two is blue. Area number three is red and so on and so forth. Each state is worth a different number of electoral votes as designated by this box here in every state. Once per turn, you can play one of your speech cards to give you an advantage in that certain state. On every turn, you will roll a red dice and two white dice. The red dice will represent which area you can put your pins on, and the white dice will represent how many spaces you can move in each state. So in this example, I roll a one on the red dice and five on the white dice. The one represents that I can put a pin or pins anywhere in area one, and I can break this down however I want to do it. So let's say that I want to put one pin in Arizona and maybe uh, move four spaces in New Mexico. If at any time my pin comes all the way to the seventh line, I can go ahead and capture the state capital. That means that nobody else can come and put pins in New Mexico. After every state has at least one pin in it, play will stop. You will tabulate the scores and see who the two highest players are. Those people are still in the race. All the other players are out of the race. Play will continue round after round, and after each round, you'll go ahead and tabulate the scores again. The first person that gets 266 has become president. When this game was first published in 1952, they used the 1950 census to determine how many electoral votes you needed to become president. That number was 266. Fast forward to the year 2020, and now you need 270 votes to win. Well, that's all the time I have for now. If you have a comment, comment below, or you can tweet them to me at RetroBoardGamer. And as always, may your rolls be high. And that's it for another Board Game Breakfast. Thanks so much for joining us. Don't forget, there's a contest for Hanami, a little cool card game at the beginning of the episode. You want to enter that. Keep an eye out for other stuff that's going on our channel. We're going to have different contests. I want to do a quick shout out here to some of our Kickstarter backers. I want to say thank you to Hilmar, the Drupal Viking, and to Kevin Fulham, and to Ali Metanen, and the BAP gaming community in Finland, in Tampa, Finland. Thank you all for supporting our show. We really appreciate it. I hope everyone here is having a great week. I know there's a lot of stuff going on this week. I know this is a big week uh, in the U.S. There's Election Day tomorrow. If you're a U.S. citizen, you should vote. Um, but there's all sorts of things going on. But hopefully you're enjoying gaming and you'll have a lot of things to come and hear us talk about this week. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast on the Dice Tower. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. 
Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production.